If you're hearing this, then it means that I escaped. My story is a brutal one and I'll share it in the style that it was intended to be read, so that you might understand, so that you might see it through the eyes of one who suffered. And please consider this a cautionary tale. It is, I admit, unlikely that you will find yourself in such a situation. But hey, you never know, right? My name is Cater and I take pride in my work and I work on the pipes. My current job revolves around an oil pipeline in the Persian Gulf. It's at the very bottom of the sea between Saudi Arabia and Iran. It's just gone midday but unfortunately, we are too far down for the light at the surface to reach us. So my current surroundings are illuminated by nothing more than the yellowish beam of my flashlight. A small collection of bubbles escape from my diving mask. They ripple up and out of sight as I gently kick my flippers, slowly propelling myself through the gloom. As a worker down here, I am one of three, but the others are not currently visible to me. My beam lands on the great metal pipe, the one that extends up and into the habitat, a cage-like artificial pocket of air, and down, down into the depths below. I look down and cast my beam over the pipe's body. The light catches on nothing but the rusted metal, a lone, a cylindrical obelisk in the watery world around me. I lower the beam and I cast it as far down as it'll go, but all I see are my flippers beneath me, gently kicking, and the great pipe vanishing into the blue-black darkness beneath my feet. A chill passes through my body. I hear the sound of my heartbeat in my ears. Where this vertical pipe connects to its horizontal brother on the ocean floor, there is an enormous metal structure of sorts, one with the purpose of keeping a series of temporary installments attached to the pipe in place. I cannot see this monstrosity at present, but the simple act of knowing, knowing that far below lurks a monstrous metal skeleton, waiting patiently beneath my feet. My shiver. They tell tales about this place, you know, about the sea. Tales of malevolent spirits that play tricks on divers. Water jinn, they're called. These spirits show the divers illusions and distortions to confuse them. They get them deliberately lost as a form of amusement, the tales say. And then depending on the spirits' moods, they either get bored and let them go. Or they devour them. Something glitters in the gloom in the corner of my eye, and I wheel around in the water raising the beam of the flashlight, a gasp escaping into my mask. But the beam lands on nothing more than a school of tiny silver fish. They flutter by and pay me no mind, and I catch my breath. Idiot cater, I murmur to myself, my voice obscured by the mask and I kicked my way up through the water, following the pipe towards the habitat's air pocket. I see the water line rippling above me, it draws closer and closer and I catch sight of flashes of color beyond my comrades. Eventually I break through the surface, popping off my mouthpiece and raising my mask, shaking my hair as I clamber up onto the little platform that surrounds us. A bench light apparatus that goes all the way around the inside rim of the habitat. As I said before, I am one of three. My colleagues are called Amir and Ahmad, and they sit waiting for me, their legs dangling over the side, their flippers dipped in the water beneath. I let out a grunt and a sigh as I take a seat beside them, my own flippers half submerged in the water beneath. It seems almost paradoxical, this little space, a marvel of physics. We sit far below the surface of the sea in the small confines that the habitat provides, and yet we have air to breathe. The habitat is a metal box about 4 meters in width and 3 in height. The air in here is dank and stale, but it is at the least quite breathable. From the center of the water between us, the pipe extends up and into the stagnant air. The pipe is currently corked by an enormous rubber plug one that we will need to deflate before our shift is over. Its purpose is to prevent the oil inside the pipe from leaking out into the sea. Thanks to the habitat, we can safely remove it now, 
without risk of environmental damage. The pipe in question goes all the way down to the bottom of the sea in a straight line, and there it splits in two and travels horizontally across the sea floor. One end travels north a few miles out from the Saudi Arabian coast, and the other travels south. It's just about wide enough for a man to squeeze down, should an emergency repair need taking place from the inside, but the diameter is not large. I wipe some of the salt water from my face as Amir connects a long black cable to the depressurizer. The end of the cable leads down into the pipe and is connected to the rubber plug. You see any spirits down there today, Kadar? Amir asks me as he fastens the seal on the cable. The Jean of Bahar. Ahmad chuckles, a scratch in his beard. His voice, as does Amir's, echoes around the somewhat claustrophobic confines of the habitat. I smile dryly. And no spirits, Amir, just. I think about the pipe, disappearing down into the darkness far below. I can't quite explain why it gives me the creeps, it just does. Just what? Amir asked me. Um, nothing, I finish. What about you guys, any spirits? I turn to Ahmad. Have you finally caught sight of the Jean al Bahar? I wave my hands and fingers, mysteriously teasing him, but Ahmad is undaunted. You mock, Kadar, but this sea, this ancient sea, if we're going to see one, then it'll be here. He claps his hands together and a small shower of water droplets splash down into the water by her feet. The shimmering blue gateway to the sea below, the sea above, and the ocean all around. And I tell you what else, he continues, raising a finger. I did see something. Oh, here we go. Amir mutters, rolling his eyes. No, no listen, Ahmad says hurriedly. I just listened to this. So there I was right about an hour ago, swimming around near the pipe when I may have gotten a little distracted by a fish. Amir shakes his head and we exchange a glance. You should have seen it, Amir. A great, a golden thing. I wanted a better look so I left the pipe and followed it. Just for a short while and eventually, it got spooked and vanished into the blue. Ahmad falters and he rubs his chin. It was actually quite an alarming experience. I turned back to the pipe and of course I saw nothing but the endless void of the ocean. I tried to retrace my steps but again there were no steps. I was alone and it was frightening. Amir and myself remained silent. But then, that's when I saw it. I saw them. Ahmad continues, practically jumping on the metal ledge that we're all perched on. Hey, easy, I say, as I feel myself rattle in time to his jumps. Amir flicks a switch on the depressurization machine. It starts to rumble. Ahmad leans forward, looking between us. Out there in the far distance, I see a trio of shapes. Three figures like shadows in the deep in the gloom. Oh, you should take up poetry. Amir mutters and he flicks another switch. Against my sense of better judgment, I am too engrossed in Ahmad's story to pay attention to exactly what it is that he's doing. What kind of shapes? I ask. What kind of figures? They were like smoke. Except no, more like mist maybe. Thick, dense mist. With eyes that flickered pale like refracted sunlight. He had to look a certain way to see them. Ahmad's voice drops low and becomes wistful. I saw them only for a second or two and then they were gone. Vanished. How'd you get back to the pipe? I ask. Did the spirits show you the way? Amir chuckles. Oh, well, no, I just use the compass, Ahmad says. But that's beside the point. I saw something I know that I did. I thought the spirits were supposed to be dangerous, Amir says. The stories always tell of how cruel they are. They play pranks on divers like us, you know. They bang on the pipes. They groan and moan from the inside. Makes you think that there are monsters inside, waiting to burst right out and get you. Oh, well, maybe that's why they appeared to me, Ahmad says thoughtfully, and then gestures to the pipe between us. Maybe they were trying to warn us. 
Perhaps there's a monster in the pipe. Amir snorts. Don't be ridiculous. Maybe once the plug is deflated, Ahmad says softly, maybe the beast will spring right out. And where would we go? We are effectively trapped down here when you really think about it. There is a moment of uncomfortable silence broken only by a slow hissing produced by the depressurization machine as it begins its work deflating the plug in the pipe. Psh, Amir says after a beat shaking his head. Don't say such stupid stuff. What nonsense. All I'm saying, Ahmad finishes shrugging, is that the spirits are necessarily something to be feared. I know you guys don't really believe, but they can be helpful too. They don't devour people. The Jean al Bahar. Mischievous maybe, but not unkind in their own way. Amir grunts and waves his hand dismissively. Ahmad looks at me for support and I just laugh. Come on, I say. Enough is enough, I think. We have work to do. Wouldn't want Zahir to snitch on us again. The conversation shifts and a collective groan echoes around the habitat. I can't stand that guy, Amir says dramatically and we all laugh. Our collective dislike of the man has become a running joke between us. Zahir is technically a colleague of ours and although we rarely work in close capacity, his projects always seem to be in tandem to our own, so we're never quite rid of him. He has thick red hair and a ridiculous scraggly beard, and all in all he makes himself an easy target. A busybody and a teacher's pet you see, he clocks in more hours than he has to, unpaid I might add, yet despite his enduring and tragic efforts, he always gets passed up for promotion because he has a vacuum for a personality. Zaheer is entirely devoid of charisma. Maybe we should play a prank on him before we go up, Amir suggests, as the machine deflating the plug kicks up a gear. The hissing grows louder. What kind of prank? Ahmad asks. I don't know. We could head over to his side at Azrak 1. Bang some pipes and make some noise. Give him a little spook before his shift is over. It could be fun. Nah, it wouldn't be worth it, I reply. As much fun as that sounds, Azrak 1 is a kilometer and a half away. Do you really want to swim all that way for some childish prank? And besides, we would never fool Zaheer with a spirit BS. The man doesn't believe in anything. He has no imagination. Ah, true. Amir nods regretfully. He fiddles with the machine beside him and he gives it a light slap. And it does its job. And finishes deflating the plug to a sufficient degree, freeing up a space around it and opening a way down into the pipe. What this was supposed to do was to allow us to reach in, haul the deflated plug out and check for leaks, damage, and whether the plug needs a potential replacement. Oh, we should have been able to do this easily and safely, as the pipe at this time and on this day is supposed to be filled with oil. But for whatever reason, the pipe is not. There is, as it turns out, significantly less oil inside than we were told, and was believed. And so what happens instead takes place over the course of a few terrible seconds. A true nightmare that I would never ever be able to forget. The positive pressure inside the habitat, the little atmosphere keeping us alive, rushes instantaneously into the pipe and forces down the small amount of oil at a monstrous and inhuman speed. This motion creates what I can only describe as a blinding vortex. The air in the ocean are hauled up and around like a sudden whirlwind of chaos and terror in the blink of an eye. My vision is lost to a brutal and immediate rush of darkness as my body is slammed into the habitat wall. I scream but all that I produce is froth and bubbles as my shoulder cracks on the edge of something metal. I don't know which way is up or down. The safety in the sanctuary of the habitat is shattered. I can see nothing but shadow as water blasts into my nose and my mouth and eyes and I'm sucked instantly and brutally down into the pipe. I can feel its walls pressing against me on all sides and I'm dragged cataclysmically between them.
I am forced through the water and the oil head first at near breakneck speed. Blood rushes to my head as my arms and legs are smashed and battered against the metal. There is only terror, terror, and darkness. My head strikes against the metal as the pipe levels out, and the world behind my screwed shut eyelids flashes red and then white. A ringing echoes in my ears and competes with the thunderous rush of the water as I release an involuntary bellow of pain. Oil and seawater pour into my mouth, my lungs, and I swallow some and breathe in the rest, choking and drowning as I'm dragged through the pipe along the seafloor. I'm going to die. This one singular thought plays over and over in my head. I'm going to die and this is the end. The terror of my situation for a quick fleeting moment is replaced by an eerie calm. The sounds of the rushing hammer and water do not lessen, but I find my attitude changed. It soothes me and I think about a beach that I visited as a young child with my family as I prepare to take my final breath. Except, instead of producing bubbles as I do so, I instead begin to choke and to splutter. I start to cough, spluttering, coughing, and I realize at once that this can only mean one thing. I have found air. I gasp and retch. I try to bring my hands up to my mouth but they bang painfully against the inner wall of the pipe. My right wrist throbs angrily. Sending shards of pain shooting up my arm, I think the entire hand may be broken. Air, I think to myself, and the vision of the beach is lost. The terror floods immediately back into my mind in the same manner as the water was hauled into the pipe. Most of my head is submerged in the water, though my eyes and nose and mouth are free. If I lift my head, then my ears are raised above the waterline and I'm able to hear but the action presses my forehead against the cold metal above me. I've stopped moving, and the reality of my situation suddenly sets in. I'm in the pipe. Oh no, I murmur aloud, retching as I cough up water and oil. Oh no, 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 I scream. I slam my good fist against the metal, shouting for help. Please, I scream into the pitch black darkness. Please, someone, Amir, Ahmad. Panic strikes. There's nowhere to go, nowhere to turn, and no one to hear me. I can barely move. The water ebbs and sloshes around my face and I gasp. My breathing becomes shallow and dangerous. You're not drowning, I have to keep telling myself. You're not drowning. You have some air, you can breathe. You can breathe, calm yourself. Calm yourself, Kadar. I try to raise my legs and one of my flippers kicks against the roof of the pipe. I try to turn a little to my side and realize that to do so requires significant effort and a reasonable degree of pain. I have done some serious damage to my shoulder and my neck too perhaps. The simple act of raising my head causes immense pain to shoot down my spine, but to allow my head to lower completely would mean the majority of my face is submerged. I force myself to slow my breathing. That's the priority. Nice steady breathing. In and out, slow, deep breaths. With grunts of pain and a hammering heart, I shuffle and twist as best I can, searching my person for my scuba equipment. I believe that I'm only wearing a single flipper now. The other must have been torn off as I was sucked into the pipe. No other equipment can be found. My breathing mask in the air tank, it's all gone. It's gone. Oh God, I whisper and despite my sense of logic, I bang against the pipe. Hello, I shout into the inky darkness. Hello, is anyone there? Kadar? Comes a voice from a little ways back along the pipe. It echoes from the darkness beyond my feet. I try to raise my face a little higher to look down into the void, but it's futile. I can see nothing. Hello, I shout back. Who is it? Ahmad, are you all right? Kadar, he shouts. A relief, tempered with terror. You're alive. I can breathe. Are you okay? Another voice echoes from beyond, even Ahmad. It is fainter, but I can still hear. Guys, comes the voice of Amir. Guys, are you both all right? 
Oh, thank the Lord, I mutter, holding back a sob of relief. Amir, Ahmad, it's Kadar. Are you hurt? Yes, Amir calls after me. I believe one of my arms is broken. Likewise, Amir shouts, and then a little quieter. I think my legs are too. Oh, God. He releases what sounds like a cry of pain and then swears. Oh, what do we do? Ahmad calls into the pipe. What do we do? He kicks against the pipe, and the sound reverberates down and over my head. Okay, hold on, just hold on. I shout, clenching my hands into fists, thinking, using my overheating brain as best as I can. The three of us are all alive. We're trapped in the pipe at the bottom of the sea. No one knows that we're down here and once they find the wreckage of the habitat, they'll probably assume that we were killed instantly, cast out into the sea perhaps. I feel the panic returning. I try to stretch out my limbs but I'm unable. I kick the pipe in frustration and let out a shout of rage. Kadar, calm down, calls Ahmad. It's all right, we'll be all right. Yeah, yeah, I need to calm down. First things first, the pipe, when it reaches the sea floor, it splits into two. I don't know if we've been pulled north towards the site of Azrak 1 or south towards the site of Azrak 2. How far away are they? I try to think. Azrak 1 is situated around 1.5 kilometers north of our former location at the habitat. Azrak 2 is over twice that distance south. I have no idea how far along we were pulled down the pipe. It all happened so fast. We could be hundreds of meters in either direction by now. All I know is that the air we're breathing and the pocket created is likely due to the undulations in the pipe small bumps and raises over support beams. It's entirely possible that there are more of these further down the tunnel, but how large is each air pocket, and at what point do they run out? Okay, I shout down. Friends, I have an idea and we don't have time to waste. All ears, brother, Ahmad calls up. There's a moment of silence. Amir, Ahmad calls down. Yes, he replies weakly. I'm here, but I'm not in good shape. I'm going to be honest. Hey, it's okay, I shout, forcing my own confidence to grow, believing in hope for us, for the sake of my friends, if not for myself. We're going to be all right. Just listen. I clear my throat and the sound bounces off the pipe above me and back into my face. I raise my head to clear my ears from the water and I wince from the pain. We need to move, I shout simply. We cannot stay here or we'll die. Any further pressure changes and the pipe could fill with water to the brim. And regardless, sooner or later we'll use up all the oxygen and we will suffocate. So I propose this. We do our best to move. We shuffle our way along the pipe as far as we can. If we're in luck, we've been pulled north and we don't know how much distance we've already covered. Azrak 1 is one and a half kilometers away at the max. That's a distance that we can make, I'm sure of it. And if we've been pulled south, Amir calls. To this, I remain silent. The sound of something low and deep reverberates along the pipe. Then shakily, Ahmad replies. All right, Kadar, I'm with you. We do this. We crawl our way along the pipe and we pray. Amir, I call down. What do you think? He coughs and groans. Kadar, he says. Look, I can barely move. I can't do this. You can, Ahmad shouts out. You can. No, Ahmad. Amir groans again. My injuries are bad. I can't move more than an inch. I'm, I'm going to have to wait behind. We can't leave you behind. Ahmad splutters, but Amir interrupts. Go, he says. And once you've escaped, you'll know where to find me. Just go, all right. You said yourselves the clock's ticking. So go. I hesitate and then release a long and shuddering sigh. God save you, brother, I call down. We'll be back, I promise. We won't leave you. I know, he says, his voice distant and quiet. God, I mutter angrily, slamming my fist against the pipe. Ahmad, are you ready? There's a pause. 
Yes, he says. I'm right behind you, Kadar. Let's do this. And so we begin our venture. Excruciatingly claustrophobic does not even begin to cover it. The knowledge that beyond these narrow confines is nothing more than the great weight of the ocean does not fill me with bravery. Every inch that we travel requires an exertion. I find little to no leverage on the wet, slippery, and oil-soaked base of the pipe, so I have to find the slightest and narrowest of grooves, mostly around the upper half, and press my toes or heels into them, using my one good hand and my one broken hand to help force myself along through the sloshing, sinister waters. I can see nothing. There is no level of light at all for my eyes to adjust to, so in pitch darkness we remain. As we move, I try my best to keep track of the distance traveled. My estimate, I think, is reasonable after two or three meters. After ten, my grasp is feeble, and beyond that I simply lose track. It's impossible to tell. We just keep shuffling our way down the pipe, listening to the sounds of our breathing, occasionally calling down to each for reassurance, Ahmad and I. Slowly and steadily through this underwater pipe, inch by agonizing inch. It's tough to tell how much time passes, but after around 20 minutes, I make a disturbing discovery. It was gradual at first, so gradual that I did not notice, but there is now a significant stress placed on the back of my neck. I'm having to hold my face as high as I can, and my forehead has been pressed against the metal for a while now. It is only when I have to alter the shape of my lips to inhale the air that I realize. We're running out. I suppress a wave of panic and I stop moving at once, shuffling back the way that I came to give myself a little more airspace to work with. Water sloshes in my ears and obscures my hearing, but I call down to Ahmad. Ahmad, I call. Can you hear me? Yes, he shouts back coughing. Everything all right? Ahmad, I falter. Ahmad, we're about to run out of air. There's a pause. Oh, what do you mean? He asks, his voice higher and more anxious. I mean the air pocket is about to expire. Another pause. Maybe there's another one further down. I've seen the schematics of the pipe. The undulations are not regular, so there could be another pocket. But what if there isn't? I shout back, chest now rising and falling desperately. God. There is no space, no light. I can't breathe. I can't breathe. Get a hold of yourself. Ahmad shouts and it cuts through the madness. I seize hold of his words and allow them to anchor me. We can do this, brother. I take a deep breath. All right, I say. All right, here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to move as fast as I can along the pipe. I'll hold my breath and I'll search for an air pocket. Regardless of whether I do or don't, I'll be back to let you know, okay? You're a brave man, calls the voice of Ahmad. Don't overdo it, good luck. Okay, I say, heart pounding. I begin to take a series of slow and deep breaths, gently and gradually expanding my lungs, preparing them to hold for as long as they're able. The sound is cold and eerie in the darkness. Steady and deep breaths. My chest rises and falls. I shuffle back along the pipe, my face pressed against the pipe, the air metallic and oily and grim. I can't hear anything now. The water comes all the way up to the sides of my lips. Shaking, I press my hands against the sides, doing my best to ignore the pain shooting through my right hand wrist. Here we go, Kater. I take my final breath in, my lungs filled to their maximum capacity, and I brace myself against the pipe, using my hands and feet to push myself further along. The air is lost and I'm completely submerged beneath the water. It forms a constant, steady roaring rumble in my ears. I use anything that I can to increase the distance that I'm able to move. My elbows, my knees, heels, my shoulders. I use them all to search for leverage. Inch by inch, faster than before, I force myself through the pipe. My heart pounds. The beat is loud, so, so loud. My chest trembles. 
but I keep moving as far as I can. Inch by inch, inch by inch. Don't panic. If you don't find air, then there's really nothing for us. We'll suffocate or drown or worse in the belly of the pipe, and we may never be discovered. I have to keep moving, inch by inch. My hands reach a particularly oily section of the pipe and instead of pressing against the sides, they slip right off. In a blink, my momentum is lost, and I fumble and splutter in terror as I realize that my means of propulsion have now failed me. No, I think with flashes of terrible urgency. No, no. Bubbles unseen escape from my lips as I writhe in the darkness, suffocating in the cold embrace of the rusted beast. Please, I beg, sending up prayers to a god that I have neglected, desperately searching for a workable surface. My foot finds a subtle groove and I'm able to push myself another inch, and from there I'm able to move another. My journey continues but I am rewarded with no relief, because soon I will need to breathe in. My lungs have already begun to ache, and if I don't find another pocket of air then I'll have to return through the pipe back the way that I came, back past these slippery and oily walls. What if I get stuck on the way back? What if I don't get back in time? How the heck was this allowed to happen? I am overcome with a sudden burst of rage and bubbles spill through my clenched teeth as I force myself deeper and deeper through the water. As hastily as I'm able, my lungs start to burn. I'm going to run out of air. Just a little further. I can search a little further. I'm going to run out of air and I'm going to die. Just a little further. I can do it. I know I can do it. And with a sudden gasp and a great shuddering breath in words, I almost laugh in desperate thankfulness as the angle of the pipe is subtly changed and I feel my face emerge into a fresh new pocket of air. It is not fresh, of course. But in that moment, it's the sweetest air that I've ever tasted. Then I come to a stop and allow some great and rasping breaths, filling and replenishing my lungs. Thank God, is all that I can murmur, over and over. Thank God, thank God, I call myself. And once I have my breath, I try shouting. I don't think that he'll be able to hear me, but I try anyway. I receive no response, so... I try knocking a rhythm on the pipe. There is still no response, so regretfully, I prepare for the return journey. I'm scared, of course, but I now know that it can be done, that there is air waiting safely for me on the other side. So I fill my lungs once again and shuffle back through the pipe, feet first this time back towards Ahmad's location. I use the material of my diving suit to help me pass by the oily section and I emerged back into the former pocket, spluttering and coughing. Oh, good lord, Ahmad shouts. Kadar, you took your time. I thought I thought you might have. It's all right, I reply. We can make it. There's another pocket ahead. Now listen. And I go on to explain the distance and what he'll need to do. And then finally, for the third and hopefully final time, we force ourselves through the watery darkness, back beneath and through the pipe with the promise of the next air pocket, our guiding light. Inch by inch as fast as I can, praying that Ahmad is able to keep up. And then as before, my face emerges into the new air pocket, but I continue moving along to allow space for Ahmad. The seconds pass, and just as I'm beginning to fret, I hear his coughing the sound of great lungfuls of swallowed air as he breathes it in. Yes, I shout, banging my good fist on the pipe. We did it, we did it, brother. Yes, he splutters. Yes, we did. And then he releases what sounds like a laugh and it fills my heart with hope. Come on, I shout to him. Let's keep on going. And so we do, on our journey through the pipe. Inch by inch, as the hours pass by, the timeless hours in the perpetual watery darkness, my joints ache, my muscles are tense and throb with exertion, but I have to keep going. There's nothing else for it. Our air pocket comes to an end, and as with before, I scout ahead. 
I have to, of course, as there's simply no way possible for a mod to pass me by. After holding my breath for another painful period of time, I am blessed with the discovery of a new breathable space, and so we continue in the same manner. These air pockets, however, grow shorter and shorter as we progress, much to my quiet alarm, but there is still just enough and so our journey continues. Every time that I have to hold my breath and go on ahead, it is a cruel exercise in willpower and mental strength, but I do my duty. I have to. We have to get out. We have to get out. An exhausting struggle through the pipe comes to a temporary halt as we reach an air pocket, a mere three or four meters in length. I start with fright as my bad shoulder knocks up against something hard and cold. It moves a little in response to the pressure that I exert upon it, so it isn't a blockage of any kind. Could it be? My heart leaves. Wriggling, squirming in the pipe, I do my best to bring my good hand up towards my head. It is not a quick process and requires some uncomfortable maneuvers, but eventually my hand can reach my neck and beyond, and my fingers explore the mysterious object. Despite everything, a grin spreads across my face and I cry out loud with joy. A mod, I shout. A mod, I found a tank. I think, yes, it's all connected. It's all here. A tank, he replies. What do you mean? I mean an oxygen tank, Ahmad. It's all in one piece. The breathing tube, yes, it's all here. That's fantastic, he exclaims. How many are there? My enthusiasm drops. I shuffle further down the pipe, searching blindly in the darkness for evidence of a potential second set of diving gear. Despite my silent pleas, however, there's only one. I can only find one here, I tell my comrade. But there might be another one further down. This is a game changer. We can do this. We can get out. Whose tank is it, Kadar? Ahmad asked me. I think my own was about half full. Yes, likewise, I reply. What about Amir's? Amir's, Ahmad begins hesitating. Kadar, I think that Amir's was almost empty. I take a deep breath. Right, I reply. Well, still, this will help. I'll use it now and I'll see if I can find another set of little further along. Wish me luck. Good luck, man, Ahmad says. Godspeed. I check the tank over as best I can. I hold the mouthpiece around my lips, giving it a few test breaths, and then on I go. Back beneath the water, though this time armed with the tank to help me along my way, I grunt and shift my body around, shuffling through the pipe, squirming my way along, and I find what will come to be the final air pocket of its type. A mere meter long, not even big enough for a mod and I to share at the same time. And to my growing frustration, there's no sign of a second tank. And so I push deeper. Onwards, through the pipe, breathing with the tank, pushing it along with me as I go. Now I discover to my bitter amusement what could well be my second missing flipper, but there is still no second tank, and no further air pockets either. Clenching my fist, I realize that I need to go back before a mod starts worrying, so I make the painstaking return journey in a time that to my friend must feel like hours. But at last, I return to our shared location and inform him of the disappointing news. He is quiet as I relay my findings and then he says in a soft voice, Kadar, I think that this is the end of the road for me. There's no use in me going any further. I think, I think that I'll have to wait here. I begin to protest, but my words die in my mouth. I mean, what is there for me to say? He's right, of course. It's a harsh truth, but he's absolutely right. He'll simply have to stay behind. The next leg of the journey, I'll have to do alone. A sudden rush of emotion swells up inside me and I force it back down. There's a time and a place. I try not to consider the fact that this may be the last time that I'll ever hear his voice. 
Perhaps I've heard both of their voices for the very last time. No, time and a place keep moving. Ahmad, I begin, fumbling for some words that'll do the moment justice, but he interrupts. See you soon, buddy, he says in the dark. I'm not able to reply immediately, but when I do, I say to him, Yes, for sure. See you soon, buddy. And with that, I'm gone. I force myself further along the tank, crawling and shuffling, and I'm submerged. My breathing is loud through the tube connected to my mouth, and when I reach the final air pocket, I allow myself a second to pause, to steal my constitution, and then this pocket too was left behind. On I go, underwater. The rest of my journey will be underwater, and since I cannot see, there's no way to tell how much air is left in the tank. If it was minor or mods, then I should have hours to spare. If it was a mere as well, no point in being coy. If it's a mirrors, then I'll likely die down here, unless I'm blessed with another surprise air pocket. It's not impossible, I tell myself as I crawl through the pipe. Water all around me, it's not impossible. And yet as the hours go by, there are no more air pockets to discover. Just more pipe. The endless, claustrophobic dark of the tunnel. How far have I come? No idea, it's impossible to tell really, and I don't even know which way I'm heading. If it's north, then there's hope, if south, then this whole venture was pointless anyway. I'll never make it to Azrak 2. Azrak 1, on the other hand. For Azrak 1, hope remains. There's still hope. Onwards through the pipe. Through the oily and poisoned water, my elbows burn with pain from the friction. My shoulders have been rubbed raw, my feet are developing painful blisters from the places that I've been forced to press them against the pipe for leverage, over and over. And my neck, my neck is killing me. It hurts to turn my head too far in either direction. I just grit my teeth and keep on going. It's too late to stop now, I must keep going. On and on and on. God give me strength. I mutter to myself as my muscles contract and sting. Give me strength to see this through. Thinking about a mod about a mirror all alone just like me, it helps propel me forwards. I can't give up, and not while they're counting on me. I can never do that. I can never do that to them, not ever. And so on I go. Endless, ceaseless dark. Endless, ceaseless torture of the pipe. Except. Except it's not endless. Not as luck would have it. The good news regarding my oxygen tank is that it definitely wasn't a mirror's. If it was, it would have expired by now. The bad news is that I've been needing deeper and deeper breaths to fill my lungs. And soon the oxygen that the tank can spare me just won't be enough. It won't go on forever. I have found no other tanks along my journey. It's just the one on my person currently and then that's it. Game over. Come on, you pipe. I hiss through the mouthpiece. You can't go on forever, you can't. And of course it doesn't. My head bashes against hard metal. Huh? I murmur in confusion. I try to continue on along my journey, but the way is blocked. I simply cannot go any further. My first thought is one of panic. I fear that I have reached some kind of wall in the pipe, one that shouldn't exist that I've come all this way to find nothing more than a dead end. Upon a little inspection, however, I realize that a space has opened up above my head. I squirm around and for the first time in hours and hours, I'm able to change positions and to sit upright. My back cracks and a rush of unbelievable relief and muscle tension flows through me. I bring up my hands to feel around me in the darkness and I almost shout for joy. The pipe has reached its end. It's going up now, vertically, up through the sea towards the surface. Oh, we came north, I laugh. The cracks of hope widening, flowing into me like rivers of silver. We've been traveling north the whole time. The end of the pipe. Upwards now. Upwards to the installation at Azrak 1. Into salvation. 
Alas, I take stock and consider the choice that now faces me. If I'm going to push onwards, then this really is it. It's a coin flip for life or death. There's not much air left in the tank, and if I climb this pipe to discover the worst, if this pipe has been stoppered or plugged, then definitively for me, there will be no way out. I really will reach a dead end. All hope will be lost and I'll drown down here with nowhere to go. No way forwards and no way back. I shake my head. There's no choice here, not really. It's all willpower. I don't have enough air in my tank to get back to Ahmad even if I wanted to. It's only forwards, forwards and upwards. All right, I murmur, bubbles spilling. Here we go. And I begin my slow and deliberate ascent. Back pressed against the pipe behind me, knees and calves against the pipe in front. Up I go, kicking at times, half swimming, half shimmying up the pipe. Up the pipe to the surface, slowly but surely. Grimacing through the strain and the pain. And still it's so dark, so unbelievably dark. The lack of light does not fill me with confidence. If the pipe was not stoppered, surely I would be able to see some light, right? I open my eyes in the water. The salt and the oil stings like crazy, but I need to see. Or try to see at the least. But there's nothing. There's no hint of light at all. And don't lose faith, I tell myself. Screwing my eyes tight shut again. Just keep going. This vertical section of the pipe is unlike the one that we were sucked down. This part here goes all the way up to the surface, up to the bustle and the relative commotion of Azrak 1. Except it won't be bustling right now, of course. I hesitate, taking a deep, strained breath through the mouthpiece, grunting with the strain. Thinking about it, the place could be entirely deserted. I don't even know what time it is. I've been crawling through the pipe for hours upon hours. I'm not sure of the exact time, but I'm exhausted. I'm starving and my oxygen is about to expire. If I recall correctly, in fact, the site won't even be open tomorrow. I rack my brains and try to remember. When are they all off site? Was it tomorrow or was it the day after? What if everybody's gone back to shore? What if the site's empty and what if nobody's there to hear me? What if the pipe is stoppered? What if? What if? I bellow in frustration and continue my ascent. Each breath becomes hard work. I'm starting to feel lightheaded, but there's nowhere to go but up. And this section of the pipe can't be longer than 80 meters or so, so surely if it was open I would see the light, right? Wouldn't I see the light? Please, I whisper, as I open my eyes again as squinting through the darkness. Terrified that at any second I'll hit a barrier or a stopper, and my journey will come to an abrupt and bitter end. Any second, at any moment, I could strike the ceiling and I'll be trapped. In the very next second, I emerge from the water. I hear the sounds of splashing as my head breaks free of the surface of water. I'm still in complete darkness, but I've reached the top. Air. I pull off the mouthpiece and suck it all down, refilling my lungs with far greater ease and rubbing and brushing the oily water from my face and eyes. I made it. I said to no one in particular, my voice echoing around the narrow little space afforded me. But now, now I have come to perhaps the final hurdle. How cruel would it be, I think, how cruel to make it so far and then to be denied rescue. So close and yet so far. I squirm and bring up my good arm with my good hand. I reach it up above me, feeling through the darkness as the water spills and drips from my elbow. A few inches above my head, I feel the lid of the pipe screwed tight shut. My heart starts pounding again. Come on, please, please. I search desperately for a release mechanism, or a valve that will open the pipe from the inside. But alas, just as I had suspected, there is no such valve. I bring up my other hand and try to force open the lid. I try to spin it to shift it, but nothing works, nothing at all. And there will be no one on the other side. I mean, why would there be? Their shift is over. They'll have all left the site by now. Cross back to the shore. 
I'm stuck. After everything, I'm just as trapped as a mirror and as a mod. I start pounding desperately on the lid. I bang on the pipe as hard as I can and I start to scream. I start shouting though the sounds will be muffled. From the outside, my shouts for help will sound just like a load of moaning and groaning, potentially even mistaken for the general rumble of the pipe itself. Help! I scream, slamming both my fists in the metal with all my remaining force, caring not for these spikes of pain that shoot through my broken wrist. Panic threatens to overtake me, now at this final stage of my journey. Help! I cry, slamming the lid and kicking the pipe, making as much noise as I'm able to before my constitution breaks. Anyone! I roar into the darkness and with the sound of a grate and sudden grinding directly above my head, the lid shifts and a curved crack of light spills blindingly into the pipe. I gasp with astonishment, the wind taken from my sails and... I slump back down into the water with a splash. My eyes are forced to close and the world beyond my sealed eyelids is a dazzling orange red. I don't even know what to say. I'm too afraid to believe what is happening. I sense somebody talking to me, their voice is confused and alarmed, and they grab me by the diving suit, by the shoulders, and with some considerable degree of effort, they haul me out and onto the platform that surrounded the pipe's exit. I'm unable to help myself from weeping. I still cannot see, but the tears streak the salt and the oil from my face. I have never felt so free. I turn and wince and stretch my arms and legs in ways that they were unable to for what felt like ages. I feel a hand squeeze my shoulder. A bottle of cool, refreshing, and above all clean water is gently poured over my face. Cater, comes a familiar voice. Cater, what on earth? He fumbles for words. Care to explain yourself, Cater? What is this? I finally manage to open my eyes, just a sliver, gradually painfully adjusting to the light from the flood lamps all around. And I'm greeted by the sight of the only employee still at his station, long after his shift had come to an end. He stares at me, his scruffy red hair and his beard a mess his expression almost comical in its confusion. A dry chuckle escapes my lips. Hello, Zaheer, I mutter. You know, I don't think I've ever been happier to see anyone in my entire life. And this, my friends, is the truth. The hours that followed passed by in a whirlwind. The company and the authorities were alerted immediately and the helicopters were sent up into the sky, and rescue boats were out in the water within the hour. The ruined habitat site was investigated and safely secured. Multiple teams of divers were sent down and they traversed the entire length of the pipe away into the night, knocking and tapping on the metal and hunting diligently for a mirror and a mod. There was tragically no response. I remember pacing up and down in one of the control rooms, fielding calls from family in the presence of several officers and officials, as the pressure in the pipe was carefully leveled as it was disconnected at the safest point and open for inspection. I remember the way that I reacted when I was told the news the next morning. After a long and sleepless night, my arm bandaged. I remember the breath escaping me and I remember collapsing into the nearest chair. That's impossible, I murmured. That, there's no way. But the bodies of Amir and Ahmad were discovered together about ten or so meters north from where we were suckered down. It was ruled that the two men had died on impact within the pipe, almost instantaneously. It's likely they weren't even aware of what had happened. Their last conscious moments, I'm told, most probably took place in the habitat itself before the disaster. To this I say nothing. I simply look out the window as the morning sun reflects and glimmers sparkling in the gentle waves of the sea far below.